Can you hear it? No. We did for a second, then something happened. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I could hear it for a couple seconds and then it just went out. I don't know how to get it to, uh, where you can hear it. Okay. Stand by. South Carolina homeowners, all the electric homes. Yep, it started, then it went away. That was me. Oh. All right, hold on one minute. Uh, I'm trying to find the video he's got. Yeah. Which I'm looking at is. Your local lineman dress for safety. Okay. I got it if you want me to share it. Uh, stop. Stop. All right. All right, gentlemen, full share screen, share screen, share screen. Got it. You got it? Yeah. Here we go. Understand the safe work practices. That's why our qualified linemen can make these energized connections. But we're asking that you have a general hands off policy. During that four year accredited program, it's actually two years before they can make any sort of energized connections. They learn the electrical theories necessary to perform the work safely. They have specific personal protective equipment that they wear, starting with a hard hat. That hard hat has an in solution value up to 20,000 volts. That's if they're working in a bucket and they make their head bounces off an overhead conductor, it will actually protect them up to 20,000 volts. Moving down, you'll see that very thick rubber insulating material, the rubber gloves and sleeves. That rubber gloves and sleeves has an insulating value of up to 17,000 volts. Every 55 days at our company, we collect every person's rubber goods materials, ship it out to an outside laboratory, and have them test 20,000 volts. That way we can protect and ensure that its protection is available for our qualified linemen. Every morning, they do a blow-up test to make sure that there's not the slightest pinhole in that rubber glove or sleeve material, because that slightest pinhole can have actually electricity tracked through it, which would be catastrophe for our qualified linemen, as they use that as their last means of defense. Moving through their uniform, it's actually a fire retardant material. That material is designed to automatically self-extinguish if they were ever in that intense heat in an arc flash environment. What that means is, as soon as it ignites, it's going to automatically go out. If you were wearing the clothing that you're probably wearing now, synthetic fibers, that material will actually burn and melt into your skin. That's why they say sometimes you're better off naked than wearing any clothing whatsoever in that arc flash environment. What? Yeah. Lastly, steel toe, right. their steel toe boots aren't just your normal construction steel toe boots. They have a step potential value of up to 20,000 volts. Step potential is an electric phenomenon in which ripples of electricity actually ripple from the center out, much like ripples in the pond. So if you were to put one foot on one ripple, one foot on another ripple, you would actually bridge that gap between those different potentials. Almost the same as going up and grabbing an overhead conductor. The equipment that they use, Jeremy's used, actually holding a uh, hot stick right now, that is a fiberglass resin material that we test every six months to 100,000 volts per linear foot. That way we can ensure that if we're using this equipment, we can ensure that they're isolated from any energized Okay. Yeah. All right, Mr. Jackson, you got anything you wanna to add to this? Uh, no, sir. Okay. And I know you, you guys, I mean, we've talked about this a lot and 
and we you will continue to talk about it if you stay in this industry. Um, safety is nothing to frown upon. Uh, you talk about these things over and over and over and over again. And I know we talked about uh, PPE several times here, but um, and it may seem like it's getting old, but um, don't care. It's something that's going to be melted into your brain that that is the lifeline for you as a lineman um, to keep you safe to go home to your family every day. Um, and the things that he talks about here where he he talked about the guys hard hats and uh, what they're the rating on the uh, rubber goods. Um, one thing I want to point out about it, I don't know if anybody paid attention until we really hadn't talked about it too much. Let me see if I can get the guys. Right here, I like to see this picture. You see he's got his name written on these um, glove protectors. Um, guys, these rubber gloves will be your PPE, and that's personal protective equipment. I know it, um, Duke, the crew I came off of, I fussed about it all the time to them that they they always wanted to grab my rubber gloves out of the, the bin and use them. And I, I really didn't like that so much because that was my personal protective equipment. That's the things that I used to keep me safe. Now, if it was something where, you know, um, they had to have them, I didn't mind, but them just being lazy and not wanting to go back to their truck and get their own gloves. No, that that's my stuff. I, I kept them clean. Um, I looked after them, they were mine, did not want anybody else wearing them, like I said, unless it's an emergency. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, that's your PPE, those kinds of things to keep you safe. Um, talked about the hot sticks again, what is rated for. Tell me, what, what did he say this hot stick was rated at? Anybody? Same as all fiberglass products, 100,000 volts per foot. Per foot, exactly. That never changes. Leave that right there. Okay. Okay. A uh, gentleman, things here to look out for and uh, do remember, please. The rubber glove protectors are meant for rubber gloves only. Correct. You cannot use your uh, protectors as regular gloves because you'll get them uh, if you did they get torn up doing something else. Or they get punctured doing something else and you go put them back on a rubber glove then you don't have rubber glove protection anymore you'll notice also below his name right there can anybody make that out what's underneath that there's white writing on there it's dates it's a date so if you get and this is something to watch out for when you get your rubber gloves back from being tested make sure they are stamped with the date they were tested if you've got a pair of rubber gloves on that are more than 30 days old from the date that they have not been tested in the correct time period, correct, Professor V? Correct. All right, so make sure you check that date. I have seen them get sent off and come back and either did not get tested or they didn't get stamped. You've got to have that verification white stamp on that uh, rubber glove piece right there. Yeah. Something we haven't talked about before, rubber gloves do come in sizes. Yep. So you can size your rubber gloves. And like Professor V said, I mean, this is, rubber gloves are like the wallet in your pocket. Man, you don't wanna, you don't want anybody else to use them. You wanna keep them in a safe place. And we just talked about the stick and the sticks value is what? Voltage value? 100,000. 100,000 100, per foot. Gentlemen, you can take that same value and put it to any fiberglass product that's used in the industry. So the telescopic sticks that we're using out there in the field, they're insulated to 100 kV per foot. The boom on a bucket truck or the boom on a line truck is insulated to 100 kV per foot. You will get a brand new bucket truck or a brand new line truck for the manufacturer and the manual will come with the truck and guess what it says right there in the front page of the manual. Danger, warning, this is not an insulated device. It's made of fiberglass. <laughs> Why do they say that in the front of the book? Because it's not all fiberglass. Well, fiberglass is fiberglass. If I'm working on a 120 volt line, I got one foot of fiberglass, I've got 100,000 volts of protection, correct? Correct. They cannot guarantee, once it leaves their factory, 
they cannot guarantee the integrity of the boom due to damage, due to dirt, water, and tear and all. hydro fluid, everything like that. So your rubber gloves are the front line of defense between you and whatever you're working on. All right, these are tested every month. These are tested by you, how often? You as a person. Every day. Nope. Okay, before each use. There you go, thank you very much. Before every single use, you're gonna test these things. So this is your front line of defense. You know, in the first part of the video, I don't know if you guys heard it, how long does it take a lineman for SMECO, that's Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative, to be able to work anything energized at all? Anybody catch it? Three years. Three years. So they're gonna have a lineman in training for three years before they can work anything energized at all. That's, uh, that's company dependent, depends on the company you work for. Yeah. Okay, carry on. All right, let's see. Um, we talked about um, rubber goods, rubber, and, and I'll just add what he said about these gloves being tested. I was able to go to a, a testing facility up in Raleigh early on in my career and view the testing lab. And these things come in, of course, they're, they come in in special boxes. And there are hundreds of gloves dumped into Florida after going a big washer and in a, in a dryer and in their testing. So I mean, there, there's a possibility that a pair or two may, you know, get kicked to the side and not get tested good. So check those dates. Um, what else did he hit on? Your boots. Um, guys, just make sure that whenever you get your boots inside that tab, uh, inside the, the side lining of the boot, it has an EH, you know, stamped into the side of it somewhere so you know it's an electrical hazard boot. Very important. All these things work together. You hold right there at the boot. All right. It's EH for it's an electrical hazard boot uh, preventing a step potential. Yeah, I, you know, if we, we saw a previous video. I can't remember. It was Professor V's, I think, or it was a demo, and they showed the guy wearing the rubber boots over their boots, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not 100% on the electrical hazard. Boot, yeah, when a boot looks like this, right? This guy, uh, it's not the bow legged guy that was on the right hand side, doesn't look like him. These boots have got some wear and tear on, them. yeah. So, uh, don't think that you can just step up to a down energy, you know, a down line that's energized or anything like that and put reliance in your boots. I'm, I'm not me, myself, my opinion. Yeah, you get boots to start looking like this or get dirty or get wet, I'm not going to test it, that's for sure. Yeah. And guys, that's, that's just about it. Just remember that whatever PPE you have, guys, it's going to be up to each and um, leave, it, leave it there. Okay. Go ahead. You can continue. It's, leave it there it's up to you all to make sure that your stuff is, you know, kept up to standards. Nobody's going to come behind you. And monitor you every day. It's going to be up to you to make sure your rubber gloves are clean, that they don't have holes in them. They're tested. Hard hats in compliance. And hard, hard hats do go out of compliance. I think you have to, we used to have to replace ours like every five years. Um, they'd send us a new one. So just make sure that everything's in the date. Make sure you're, you know, just like these guys, they're pretty sharp here, except for Mr. Bowlegs. Um, They've got the shirt tails tucked in. They, they look very professional here. So it's going to be up to you guys to make sure you use it the way it's supposed to be used. Okay. Uh, you, you said it right there, Professor V, about the shirts. I don't know how many linemen I've seen out there, and this is just not electrical linemen, all linemen that work for utilities and that take and untuck that shirt. Yep. All right. You cannot untuck your shirt. Why? Expose the skin. Right. Well, uh, and I've yeah. seen it. I've seen yeah. it in demonstrations. I haven't seen it, you know, with anybody in person, an arc blast. And it is, it's a concussion shockwave blast anywhere below the bloat line, uh, belt line will actually blow your shirt open. And all that arc energy is going to go up inside the shirt. You got to keep your shirt tucked in. These guys do like kind of spiffy and clean right here. And uh, one last thing before we leave, 
I didn't see anything on them, but they're rubbered up pretty good. Limit the amount of metal you have to none on your body. Yeah. Okay, so you guys with earrings, uh, regular finger rings, nose rings, whatever you wear, no wireframe glasses, no watches uh, on your body itself. Even though you have all this protective material, and I'll give an example of myself right here, metal attracts heat even through material. So uh, I told you the story of when I was electrocuted, I had change in my front pocket and you can actually see the circle where the chain uh, change got hot and left a circle burn mark on my leg that's through my fire retardant jeans. So get all that metal off your bodies. Yep. Okay, Professor V. Hey, one last question for you, Professor Schumacher. At Sanity Cooper, do you have a choice of what kind of shirts you can buy or pants that you can get for uniforms? You, you do. Uh, you have the option of jeans, which everybody everybody pretty much went to jeans. Right. The uh, pleated pants were just so hot. These jeans did breathe a little bit. And you could get a short sleeve or long sleeve shirt. Now, of course, anytime that you had to work around voltage, any voltage at any time, if you were short sleeved, you need to put rubber sleeves on. Right. All right. If you're working on voltages between zero and 600 volts, you had to put uh, long sleeves on. Right. And yeah. you, could, you could avoid the rubber sleeves. There's a lot of things that you can do out there. And, and we'll, we'll stick on this for just a moment. Your fire retardant clothing has a value to it. And it's in calories per, calories per inch. Oh, calories in heat energy per inch. So at certain voltages, and we'll stick with this a little bit. You might want to look at it, look for a video there, V. Okay. All right. All <laughs> voltages, as far as an electrical electrical are at any voltage, do they produce the same amount of heat? So if I if I have an arc flash at seven through seven thousand two hundred volts to ground right in front of me. Is it going to produce the same amount of heat energy as would a 120 volt to ground fault? I wouldn't think so. Anybody else? It's going to be pretty close, if not on the money. The, the, heat, the heat itself is going to be the same. It's going to be right around 3,000 degrees centigrade, which is hotter than the sun. All right. It's the intensity and duration that really fire retardant clothing is made for. So, I mean, intensity. A 120 volt flash is going to be relatively small and either trip something out or burn itself in the clear. 7,200, bigger, bigger, bigger. And you can see where I'm going right here. And the duration depends on how many milliseconds, microseconds, or seconds that that arc flash lasts. So different types of uniforms are going to be required for different types of voltages. Now, do you think linemen are out there in the world changing clothes through the course of the day when they're working different voltages? No. No, you can just add additional. And the typical thing that we did out there, especially in the wintertime, is uh, Carhartt makes coveralls. And they have a value, a calorie value. So you're actually putting more clothing on and covering up your clothing to meet the voltage that you're working with. Uh, we also had in the service center that you could get a fire retardant rain jacket, the full body rain jacket. So you'd have your normal clothes on and then you put your rain jacket on. Now you've got that additional protection in calories per square inch. Same thing with you, Professor V? Yeah, that's correct. Let me share this. I just found this little, this is where you can actually order this stuff and see how much it is. See this shirt right here on the left? This is a base layer shirt. I, this is what I some of my, what Duke used to give us and I wore. It's, it's got a 5.5 a, a rating on it, um, cow rating or ounces on it. Um, if, if, you, if you're, the shirt that you were wearing did not have re, meet the requirements for the cow rating for the work you do, then you could slip this shirt on up under that and wear that or this one right here as well. Um, but it had to be this base layer stuff had to go on there. Mm -hmm. I think I still have some of these and I might wear them sometime, but 
Yeah, um, they are. People aren't fireproof, just like it says right there, but these shirts are. Now, if you wear a t-shirt out there, what kind of t-shirt can you wear? Hundred percent cotton. One hundred percent cotton. If you wear one hundred percent cotton socks, underwear, and t-shirts, you're good to go, guys. Do not get anything that's woven or a mix or anything polyester is the worst. Yeah, polyester actually melts and will melt into your skin. Yeah, I really can't find anything else, Professor Shoemaker. Okay, that's fine. Other than those shirts, but I mean, there's. So many manufacturers now out there, guys. Bulwark, that's who Duke get their stuff from now. I mean, that's what we used to get our stuff. And we had so many different shirts to choose from, but you had to pay attention to that calorie rating on the order form to make sure it met to the standards because with Duke Energy so big and there's so many different parts to it, so many different from Florida all the way up to Kentucky, Indiana, that area, they work on so many different voltages. I mean, they just gave us the option to get what we needed. And if we had to get those base layers as well. So um, there's there's choices out there for you to wear. Right. Okay. Okay. Any questions there? <laughs> Who supplies your uniform? Centos. So you're gonna to go to Centos and you're gonna buy them from Centos? No, the company should buy you uniforms for you. The company. Typically, there are the company. yeah, there are two different plans out there. There's there's one where the company is gonna go ahead and get you 14 sets of uniforms. So the company one week you're gonna have a full set. You're gonna use them through the course of the week, while the other set is at Centos getting cleaned. All right, and then you're just going to rotate. They're going to come to the service center, drop off your clean ones, pick up your uh, dirty ones, and that rotation is going to stay in effect. You can go down and do your own if you want to, and that's a one week. But you have to watch them on your own. Follow the instructions that come with the uniform. Certain soaps and detergents will degrade the FR right. value in those uniforms, the fire retardant value in those uniforms. So you have to follow those directions. I'll have to admit, and Robbie's <coughs> probably got some input here. Uh, as a lineman, the whole way through working on a line crew, I was always uh, had the two week rotation. And it was payroll deducted. Most of it picked up by the company. Once I became a supervisor and just wasn't hands on that much with uh, high voltages because I was typically down on the ground, I went to the one week and then in, in wrote, just did my own. Roddy, what'd you do? We didn't have that option of having a laundry service. We we had a, um, of course, when the new guys came on, they were given, I think, two weeks worth of uniforms. But we were we're given $480 a year to buy uniforms. And that included Jack's. And that money, 480 bucks, you saw the cost of some of that. Doesn't go far, but I mean, as you buy them, you know, you start adding up and then you just kind of launder them yourself. Um, it's not a service that they offer to do, but you do have to watch out for the, the um, how you do that. You're not supposed to use fabric softeners, those kinds of things, because it will degrade the, the fire the, uh, retarded properties in the uniform. So that's one thing you have to watch out going for Duke is how you learn that. And, and a lot of this stuff that I had for years and years, as I laundered it, it got thinner and thinner and thinner and it wasn't so hot to wear. But as far as if I was to get a flash, I wasn't protected as I should have been. And that was my fault for, you know, not replacing it sooner. But um, that's, you just kind of have to watch out and be aware of those kinds of things and re, you know, replace them because it is up to you. The company was spending the money, gave you an allowance to buy those things from, um, the manufacturer that they set up set us up to get them through so um just kind of have to police yourself with that to say you know and, and i think um i counted up i cleaned out my closet when i retired a year and a half ago and i had probably 30 sets of uniforms in my closet good grief yeah i never threw anything away you're a clothes hound i was but i 
I clean my closet out and I think I, I kept like three sets in there. It's just okay. nostalgia. So yeah. I'll, I'll throw a question out there. When do you need to wear a fire retardant uniform? All the time. Anybody else? Okay. You you threw is that Santarelli? Yeah. I have to follow your company's policy. Some policies of some companies say you're required to wear your uniform 100% of the time. Uh, some companies have only around energized equipment. So if you're building a line out there from Conway to Lores and there's nothing else energized around, you don't have to wear a uniform. Sure, at least. I mean, if you're going to wear the pants, you're not going to change pants back and forth. And uh, you're only gonna have to wear the uniform shirt whenever you're working around anything energized. Was there anything else different for Duke? Were you full-time, Robbie? And what, what made the difference for us was the unionized part of Duke, it was not in their contract that they had to wear FR all the time until they got in the bucket. They, they kept pants and a shirt in their locker or hanging up in the cab of the truck because whenever they got in the bucket to work, you know, energize, um, conditions they had to put those FR clothes on but other than that I, I think it might be changed now but it used to be that they did not have to wear them 100% of the time but now you have to wear it 100% of the time. Okay all right a lot of stuff going on there with uniforms gentlemen and I know you've seen some uh, videos we've had up there with guys with uh, traffic vests on do you think the traffic vests are FR? No. Say again? The ones he was wearing? The traffic vest. It didn't look like the ones in that video he was wearing. I can tell you, everything you put on, put on your body that's provided with the utility is going to be yeah, FR. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You're going to have FR uh, jackets. Uh, you're going to have that FR rain gear. You're going to have FR gloves. You're going to have FR vests. Everything that the warehouse is going to put out to you is going to be FR. Right. I got a quick question for you, Professor. Um, with... Uh, both your companies, did you, when you rubbered up, did you have to rubber sleeve and everything from the ground or did you climb up a little bit and then sleeve up and rubber up? Let's, uh, let's take a break. That's going to be a little bit in, in discussion and we'll, we definitely will talk about that. Okay. But let's take about uh, 15, what is it? 932, let's say 945. Okay. And we'll get into that. All right. Thank you. When do you need to wear your rubber sleeves? Professor V? Was it wearing rubber sleeves? Yeah, when is it required that you put sleeves on? Um, it, it really depends on which part of Duke Energy worked for um, the, the, old, the progress, the, or I should say the, uh, the old part of progress energy, that Duke part, we did not or were not required to wear sleeves because of the type of cover up that we maintained um, when we were working on primary, we kind of went above and beyond and um, OSHA allowed us not to be, you know, not to have to wear those sleeves, whereas other parts of Duke Energy, um, they wore the sleeves like up in the Greenville area, um, up in the mountains, I think up north in um, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, those portions of Duke Energy, they wore sleeves, but we were not required to uh, just because of our cover-up methods that we worked. Does everybody understand what he, what he means by cover-up methods? Does anybody, can anybody give me an example of what he means by cover-up? Everything that's about the same as, as close can be as rubber up. Right, right, you're gonna like use rubber hoses. Right, rubber hoses, rubber sleeves, rubber blankets. And we all know the process there, guys. Cover up what's closest to you first and work your way in. Yeah. Work your way in. If, yeah. When you remove, you remove and then back your way out from the furthest point. So, that, you know, I'm kind of scratching my head on yours. You had multiple policies out there. Santee Cooper's policy was whenever your head broke the plane of a primary voltage, you had to have your rubber sleeves on, regardless. Anybody know what I mean by breaking the plane? Yes. Yeah. So if you can see me, see, say I've got a primary voltage here. 
If I needed to go above that with my head, I needed to put sleeves on all cases, whether I had it rubbered up or not. Uh, Ohio Power and Light, you know, I've talked about that one. Ohio Power, when we worked up there, Hurricane Sandy, what was their policy? Anybody remember? All the time. What is all the time? All the time. You take off your rubber gloves because when you drive, that's it. So they wore it on the ground, they wore it climbing poles, they wore it uh, making up material all the time. Now I can guarantee you gentlemen, and uh, Professor V can attest to this one too, when you're wearing all that rubber goods, hydrate. Yes. Hydrate before you start your work. You're working in 90, 95, 99 degree temperatures, the humidity at 100%, you are going to melt. There's just no way around it. Okay. Last but not least on that part, follow your company's policy. If I go to work for Duke Energy, I've got to do one thing. If I go to work for Sandy Cooper, I've got to do another thing. I'll go to work for Ohio Power, I've got to do another thing. Find out what that policy is and follow it. Now, do, Professor V, do your rubber sleeves also go through the same testing and procedure as your rubber gloves and they, do they belong to you? That's, that's correct from my understanding, um, never having worn them, but uh, working around others that have, yeah, that that's that's your PPE and you, you're to take care of it. Okay, so it's gonna follow, the rubber glove sleeves are just like your rubber gloves. You're gonna have your own pair and set, one off for testing, one, uh, one on for use. Now, uh, we'll wrap up here. How many different voltages, and I'm gonna use Sandy Cooper as a, as a uh, guide here. How many different voltages does Sandy Cooper work as far as distribution linemen are concerned? Does anybody remember? They only work with two different voltages, well, primary voltages. 12,470, that's 7,200 face to ground, and 34.5 kV, that's 19,900 to ground. Do you think they need to have different sets of rubber goods for each voltage? Yes. Yes, you do. So a, a lineman for Santee Cooper has got to have a pair of 20 kV gloves. That's for this 12,470 voltages he's going to be working. And he's going to have to have a pair of 40 kV gloves for the 34.5 kV he's going to be working. I can guarantee you, gentlemen, you go from a 20 kV glove to a 40 kV glove, they're extremely thick, hard to work with. Professor V? Yeah, we, we added one voltage in that, which was our common voltage in our area was 23 kV we worked. Um, we had a little bit of 7,200 left. Most of us been um, changed out to uh, 23 kV. And then along the coast up in North Carolina, the Wilmington area, that's where they had the um, 34 kV up there. Okay. Yeah. Any questions there, gentlemen? A little bit extensive there on the safety part, but these are great things to learn and they will come up repeatedly into the future as you guys are working with uh, primary and secondary voltages out there in the world. All right, so let's get on to uh, our next piece of subject matter. We're gonna talk about distribution substation circuit breakers today. All right, guys, I got a video for you to watch. There's your screen. Let me know if it comes up, Professor V. Looking at it. Okay. Let me know if you can hear sound. Yep. Circuit breakers allow the flow of energy to be controlled by safely switching currents on and off at all voltage levels of the energy grid. <coughs> in the open position, they have to ensure isolation across the switching distance, between phases, and to ground. In the closed position, they have to allow the energy to flow with minimum losses 
They need to be able to reliably interrupt short circuit currents without damaging themselves or adjacent equipment. They need to be able to reliably interrupt short circuit. So you'll notice if you have a short circuit, and this can be a, multiple types of, of short circuits, is a lightning strike a short circuit? It can. This is going to be over voltage, so that's going to be a short circuit. You can also have what they call either a phase to phase. That means one phase of my primary is touching another phase of my primary. That's a phase to phase fault. Or you can have a phase to ground fault, so the wire falls to the ground. In either case, you want the circuit breaker. Remember, when that happens, we're going to have a very, very large uh, amount of current flow going through here. And when I say very large, way above and beyond the normal amount of current that's supposed to go through a circuit breaker connection. It's really fast when it happens here. Uh, they're using this tree for an example. The tree comes, comes in contact with the phase. You're gonna have a short circuit, very, very high amperage. It's gonna have to break that amperage inside the circuit breaker. So we're gonna talk just a moment about, well, how does it do that? Obviously it's a mechanized process right here. And how does the arc go out? How do we extinguish the arc inside a circuit breaker? Good currents without damaging themselves or adjacent equipment, even after long idling times. What does he mean by long idling times? Do you think circuit breakers are open and closing, you know, often? No. No, they're not. You know, you want reliability on your system. Uh, my power hasn't gone out in probably about five months. So you definitely want to be able to keep, uh, you know, continuity in your system. And when they say idle times, this is going to be sitting closed almost all the time. But you still want it to be reliable and fast, even if it sits idle for long amounts of time. That's what he means by idle time. Different circuit breaker technologies are in use, depending on voltage level, application, and the age of their design. That, that is old. All right, when you see brown insulators and yeah. glass dead ends, those are glass. You can tell it's very, very old. Current interruption takes place in interrupter chambers containing air, oil, SF6, or a vacuum. Okay, so you need to note those. All right. Current interruption takes place in an interrupter. That's the tubes that's inside the uh, circuit breaker itself. And what are the arc extinguishing processes right here? What are they using to help extinguish the arc? Air, air, air oil, right? SF6, right? Or vacuum. Okay. In the air process right here, it's what they call air gapping. All they're going to use is normal air, and they're going to try to open up the breaker at the contacts as quick as possible. In air, also, there's another one to add here. It's called a puffer, P U F F E R, a puffer circuit breaker. All right, a puffer circuit breaker not only has an air gap in it and you open as quickly as possible, it will do a blast of air between the arc connections right here and blow the arc out. Now that, Professor uh, V, very old. Very old. That's the old process right here, but they still do exist, both the air gap and the air puffer. Oil is still currently in good use. SF6, probably the newest technology, even though it's been around for a while, Oils back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. SF6 was introduced. We'll discuss SF6 after the video. And then in a vacuum. These are your most dominant ones. Oil, SF6, or vacuum. So if you came to a quiz, what are the four mediums for extinguishing an arc and a breaker? Air, oil, SF6, or vacuum. Everybody know what a vacuum is? I'll take that as a no. There, there's, there's, about the air, so there's, there's something inside. Yeah, 
there, it's void. It's void of anything. You've got an air vacuum in here. So when the arc occurs, if you don't have oxygen in there, you get fire is a result of the oxygen. If you don't have any in there, it's going to extinguish the arc. So vacuum switches. They're in uh, use in circuit breakers and a lot of uh, capacitor banks. We'll talk about capacitor banks later. Circuit breakers may use multiple contact systems consisting of main contacts and arcing contacts. The main contacts allow operating current to flow with minimal losses, while arcing contacts can break short circuit currents with minimal arcing erosion. The braking element is usually operated mechanically by a stored energy system. All right, so you can see the speed of which one opens right here. Now it's showing part of the opening mechanism right here is the spring. That's the energy that they're using. But they also have, and you'll see in this uh, photograph in just a moment. The, the energy actual, that opens in- The actual loading spring. <laughs> so you see these two springs that are down here, these loading springs? One above the other right here. Guys, this is a lots <laughs> of a stored energy source. If you're gearing these uh, springs down tight and getting ready for an open or a close by the spring value, it's just like we talked about when we we're, if you're in a substation, it's just like we talked about with a transformer when we were getting ready to energize it. What do we do to the doors of a transformer when we get ready to energize them? Leave them, or a transclosure. That's what we uh, specifically discussed. What do we do with the doors? Close them. Close them. Yeah. Close them. Uh, yeah. And this is for the video purposes right here. All right. If you're working around a circuit breaker in a substation, substation maintenance is there or you're there, and yeah, they got the doors on, open on the thing, you get ready to open or close it, close the doors. Okay. If anything comes loose, if anything breaks, it's going to be contained behind the door. This uh, stored energy that they have right here in these springs is huge. It's, an, it's immense. A lot of energy being stored right there. Closes the contacts is typically stored in a spring, hydraulic, or pneumatic device or system. The stored energy is released by the trip or the close command signal. The command signal activates the trip and close Okay, so where are they getting their information? You see this relay that's opening and closing the breaker. Where are they getting the information from to make this relay work? That's a great question right there. How, do they, how does the breaker know when to open or close? Where is that information coming from? All right, I, I'll add you a clue here. What is metering or measuring the amperage to make the relay operate? Measuring and metering. Current transformer. Right, current transformers in the breaker are monitoring the amount of amperage that are going through the breaker. All right, the current transformer is obviously stepping that down. I can't put that large amount of amperage into this relay right here. It would burn it up. All right, the current transformer steps it down. And once it reaches the value where it needs to trip open or close itself, that information is going through the relay. The relay then in turn sends a signal to the mechanism in the breaker to tell it to open or close. So the CT is working in conjunction with the relay. And then it's working in conjunction with the breaker to open or close coils, releasing the drive mechanism to perform the opening and closing operation. The interrupter and the mechanical drive are the main components that are subject to wear and aging. Okay, so let's take a look at that again. Form the opening and closing up. You see how fast it opens and then it immediately closes right back. They're doing testing on this breaker. So you see an open and then an immediate close. Operation. Open, close. The interrupter and the mechanical drive 
are the main components that are subject to wear and aging. The thermal stress of load currents may cause corrosion and oxidation, and the interruption of short circuit currents erodes the contact system. Environmental currents erodes the contact system. Okay, so you see this contact system right here, obviously, meant to carry a lot of what? Volts, resistance, or amps? What's the, what's the purpose of this being copper? These parts right here are silver plated. Who said what? Uh, Tim said volts. Volts? Okay. Anybody else? Remember. Resistance? We don't want to resist electricity at all. Remember, the bigger, and this is the guy. This is the guy standing back here with it. Right? The bigger the conductor, the more I, what I, can I carry through it? Amps. Amps, right. More amps. Yeah, you can carry more amps through it. All right, so the bigger, and this is big. Out here, this looks like about, about six inches around right about here, plus on the sides right here, you'll see silver contacts. Silver's our best conductor, all right? Plus the copper that's inside. The center part right here, this fiberglass part in the middle, that's just a guide. So it goes in and out of the contacts in line. Environmental stresses such as temperature, humidity, or contamination affect the Okay, this will give you a good indicator right here of what kind of circuit breaker this is. Is this air, oil, SF6, or gas? Take a look at the left-hand side. Oil. Oil, yeah. There's your oil level right there. Perfect, 100%. All right. If it was air, you would have an air gauge. If it is SF6, you'd have an FF6 gauge plus a color coding on it to see if your SF6 was gas. So you'd have either the, the pressure, you'd have both the pressure and the gas condition, All right? Vacuum is gonna show you a negative pressure. So this is an oil circuit breaker. Now you step up to this and you see how clean this oil is right down here in the bottom and it's, that's the right, correct level. If you see a level that's up in there, what if this oil is all black? Do you think you have a problem? Needs to be changed out. Yeah, yeah. Some kind of maintenance needs to happen right there. Uh, the oil needs to be changed out. Plus, you probably have a bad contact in here that's causing a lot of arcing. So when you look at these uh, circuit breakers, you look inside of them. That when you do your substation inspection, we've talked about this numerous times before, and you see a lot of black oil in any kind of equipment right there that will let you know right away something's wrong with that piece of equipment all right your gas gauges and everything like that they're going to be color coded you're going to have a red zone and a green zone if your needle's in the green zone you're good to go if your needle's in the red zone something needs to be done bearing and linkage surfaces of the drive Ancillary components, such as bushings, are also subject to electrical stress aging. In order to ensure the proper operation of a circuit breaker throughout its lifetime, diagnostic tests are performed, such as resistance, timing, minimum pickup, travel, and power factor. Okay, we're not gonna get, that gets more into the relation of being a relay technician or a substation technician. So we're gonna stop the video there. I just want to let you know the mediums that were used as far as breaking arcs and circuit breakers, one, and the uh, different types of circuit breakers as far as their operations are concerned, okay? Now we're going to go on to a, another video here if I can find it. Back up. All right. circuit breakers are in all right you know this has come out before how do i know this is a circuit breaker just by looking at it 
bushings are all the same. Right. If you got same size bushings on both sides, that means the voltage coming in one side is the same voltage that's going out. No transformation is happening right here. So that will designate a circuit breaker. Where are the CT, where are the CTs, the current transformers at? Located right below. Right. And you'll actually see the CT and it's encased by a shield right here. So it's monitoring current through flow through it, through the breaker and then back up. And you also see the wiring that's going over here to the relay panel. Okay, you got a relay panel and you've got this panel right here where you can open and close uh, manually if you need to. So a lot of clues right here as to far what, as far as what kind of a piece of equipment it is. Now I can tell you just by experience, this is going to be SF6. This SF6 tube right here is what contains the gas. An important and critical component of the power delivery system. All right, uh, I went too fast. Critical component of the power delivery system. All right. You'll see by looking in the breaker and the breaker door, typically on the door, you'll have a window right here. So you can see through the door, through the window, what position is this breaker in, open or closed? Closed. Closed. Okay. closed. All right. And this goes to uh, Professor V could probably jump on this one too, because I know he's got different terminolo terminologies. Guys, as far as electrical system is concerned, a utility, think red hot. Yeah. Red hot. Just like the candy that you eat. If you see anything that's red in this situation, that means whatever it is is closed and the line or whatever it's attached to is hot. Some guys, and you will see this happen right here, this one's going to open for you. Oh, well, it was open. Shows you how fast they Power are. delivery system. <coughs> All right, you see the green flag right there. I, I'm not quick enough to get it. Some guys think that green means go. No, it's not. Red is hot, it's closed. Green is open. Now that does not mean that the entire breaker is de-energized. It is just opened to discontinue the entire circuit. So do remember, from now to the future, to the rest of your careers, red hot, closed, green open. That means it is, does not have a complete path. You will also notice here, and I, I can't capture it, of how fast a breaker opens. The power delivery system. That's it. That's how fast a breaker opens. We'll discuss times later on. You've also got this yellow and white flag over here. Now, what kind of breaker did I say it was? What, what's the medium that's breaking load? Gas. The FX. SF6 gas. It, you can't read the reading on this. All right. I've got to have gas pressure also and spring pressure to be, able, to be able to open and close this breaker. The white flag is discharged. The yellow flag will tell you charged. All right, so it takes a moment to reload and get loaded back up for its next operation of either open or close. And you'll see it turn here in just a moment. We'll do one, go one through one. Power delivery system. It is yellow right now. It's charged, ready to work, and it's closed. All right, it opened. Now it's doing what? Recharging. So it's recharging the breaker, and the motor is charging it back up. There are mechanical switching devices capable of making, carrying, and breaking current in normal. This is probably a test breaker. How many operations or opens have they had on it? 1,215, that's extremely high. Oh. Now, once it becomes fully charged, you'll see the yellow flag come down and tell you it's charged. Abnormal conditions. There you go. During abnormal conditions, such as when lightning strikes a transmission tower, right, during we'll abnormal one more time. carrying power delivery system. Hold on. All right, from the outside, if the breaker opens, can you see any visual open point? No. no. Okay, hold on. 
Circuit breakers are an important and critical component of the power delivery system. All right, so now we're looking in the panel. Now it's green. All right. Now it's closed again. All right, it's closed. <laughs> Their mechanical switch. When it was open or closed, can you see any visual open or closed open point, even with the door open? No. No, you cannot. It's all happening in here. It's encased. So I can't see it in the panel. I can't see it in the side. There's no window for it right here. That's <laughs> why we discussed before. When we isolate breakers with bus side and line side disconnects, these are overhead disconnects up here. I can see the bushings for them on both sides. Then I can work on this piece of equipment. I cannot get a visual open point inside a breaker. That's for safety purposes. We got to have two, one on this side, you see my mouse, and then one on the other side. Those are your two switches to be able to have visual open points so I can work on this breaker. Circuit breakers are an important and critical component of the power delivery system. They are mechanical switching devices capable of making, carrying, and breaking current in normal and abnormal conditions. During abnormal conditions, such as when lightning strikes a transmission tower, circuit breakers isolate the faulty components of the system to prevent additional damage. Ideally, in the closed position, a circuit breaker should act as a perfect conductor to ensure optimal current flow. In the open position, an ideal breaker should act as a perfect insulator and should be able to break the current instantaneously. Okay, so is there a perfect conductor? No. 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 Is there a perfect insulator? No. No. Well, you know, you try to do the best you can with what you got. And I have to admit, all right, these uh, a circuit breaker, they're very expensive, is a good conductor and is a good circuit breaker if maintained correctly. All right. You're going to have to do monthly maintenance on a circuit breaker to make sure it's operating correctly. Circuit breakers feature fixed and moving perfect insulator and should be able to break the current instantaneously. All right. Should be able to break current when? Instantaneously. All right. Put that down on a piece of paper. We're going to discuss instantaneously here in a little bit. Instantaneously is a term that you guys need to know as far as your skills out there working in the field. We're going to define instantaneous in relation to a circuit breaker. Circuit breakers feature fixed and moving contacts that are housed in an arcing chamber and are opened or closed by an operating mechanism. The breaker's operating mechanism controls the moving contact to quickly open or close the circuit. When the contacts open, an arc is created due to current interruption. An AC arc extinguishes at every zero current level, but reignites immediately after. Okay, you see how this works here? So every time you lose voltage on our AC arc right here, what happens to the arc itself? Right on the zero line. It goes to zero. It goes to zero. And then uh, if the arc was not extinguished at the zero line, it just maintains, right? It just keeps arcing across. We want to limit that as much as possible. After crossing the zero point due to the presence of voltage across the open contact. In order to avoid arc reignition, the contacts must be separated with sufficient speed and the dielectric strength across the open contacts must be able to withstand the transit voltage. Okay, so what he's saying here, I've got to open it up very, very fast to be able to break that arc. Plus, I have to have good insulation value between the two connections right here, dielectric strength. Circuit breakers commonly feature an arcing chamber where the arc is intensively cooled by insulating media. Breakers are classified based on the insulating media used for arc suppression. The main four breaker types are air blast, oil, vacuum, and sulfur hexafluoride. Okay, once again, all the same ones. Air blast, oil, vacuum, and sulfur hexafluoride. And they actually do show breakers of those types. Okay. SF6 chambers are a definite clue 
or observation when you're looking at a breaker. All right, vacuum is actually gonna have vacuum bottles where I can draw a vacuum on. Oil's going to be in a tank and it's gonna have an oil meter right here. Air blast, I've not seen an air blast in person. Have you, Professor V? No. No, air blast, that is a real old, old technology, but it's compressed air up in this area right here that blows out the arc. SF6. This timeline shows the popularity of each breaker type over the years. Most breakers today are either vacuum or SF6 breakers due to- Now, Professor V? Yeah. Uh, I know we did some big moves here in probably about 10 or 15 years ago to go from oil to vacuum or SF6. Yes. Uh, but I know they're still out there. Right. Okay, so guys, you know, water. No. They're using water to break load? Ooh. No. Wow, that's old. To their smaller size. Substation breakers are classified as either independent pole or tripole. We're not going to get into independent pole or tripole. Okay. All right, so what time are we holding here? Golly, 10 19 already. All right, let's go ahead and we'll take a break and we'll go up to 10 30 on a, on a break here. And then we're going to get more into what uh, we've seen on the videos and discuss more on circuit breakers. All right, guys, take a break. Thank you very much. All right, just uh, to touch on this because we've heard it in the definitions before for uh, arc suppressants and arc mediums, sulfur hexafluoride. And this is, I wanna bring up the safety aspect of it here, uh, is an extremely potent and persistent greenhouse gas that is primarily utilized as an electrical insulator and arc suppressant. It is or inorganic, colorless, odorless, and non-flammable and non-toxic SF6, SF6 has an octahedral geometry consisting of six. So it goes on to the uh, definition of all the components and everything are in it. The biggest thing in here and why it's used in the industry is uh, one, it's, an, it's a great insulator. So the gas itself has great insulative properties against it and it's an arc suppressant. The thing you need to look out for, and we discussed when you're doing a substation inspection and you see a SF6 gauge, it'll be either in the green, uh, yellow or red situation. Yellow means it's low. Of course, red means it's out of gas. Is if I don't have the gas in the breaker or the switch that I'm using, can I operate that switch? Is it safe? No, no, you got to check the switch first before it gets operated. And remember, most of this is going to have to happen. You're going to be walking through doing an inspection and a SCADA or an operator that's some other place there is not going to have an SF6 reading. You're the inspector here. All right, they're not going to get an alarm on it or anything like that. So if you see a switch that's in this condition, it's in the red, it will not extinguish the arc and you could have uh, a lot of damage that occurs from it. The other part is if you're working in proximity to it, extremely potent and persistent greenhouse gas. All right, can you breathe it in? No. Nope. No, it's actually an oxygen and it's heavier than air. It's actually an oxygen depleter. So you're really not gonna get poison from it, but you're not gonna have oxygen to breathe. if. Uh, SF6 is gag you. It'll gag you. <laughs> All right. The other part of suffocate. You're suffocate. suffocate from the lack of oxygen. Correct. All right. Great. And the, uh, the thing that's, uh, you won't be able to tell why it's inorganic, colorless, and odorless. You can't tell, can't tell. that it's there. So uh, you see a condition where you've got low gas on a, on a product right there. All right, stay away from it and report it. That is, that's why we wanted to bring up SF6 as far as that is concerned. Now, mineral oil, you're gonna have to clean up. A vacuum, of course, vacuums doesn't exist on a switch, still don't operate it. But none of these are, uh, I would say, quite as potent as SF6 gas. All right, so you should have a paint screen up now. Is that correct? 
Got it. Yes, sir. Got it. Got it. And a yes, sir. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Let's talk for just a moment here. A little bit of a refresher. It was a while back. I'm going to do this here. All right. Overload. Uh, that was not good. Overload. Yeah. Halt. Either phase to phase or phase to ground. Can anybody give me the definition of an overload or a fault? What's the difference between the two? An overload is just overloading the circuit. Fault is a fault somewhere throughout the line. Okay, let's talk a little bit, you're, you're tracking. Let's talk a little bit about intensity here. All right, if I've gone over load, and we'll use that substation circuit breaker we just saw. Remember that big old copper piece he had? Mm -hmm. that, that connection point, okay? It's got a load rating. It can only carry a certain amount of amps through it, right? If we go over that load, we're gonna damage that piece of equipment. So overload, and we'll just give it a rating here. It's got a load rating of 1,000 amps, all right? If we go to 1,100, we're overloading it. That's the definition of overload. Now this is overload can refer to a circuit breaker. It could refer to conductor. Uh, we know we can overload a transformer by how much? 150%. So we, you know we can do a short term overload of a transformer to 150% for a short amount of time. All right, these all have values right here. So that's overload, and that's the definition of overload. Above amp rating. And I'm gonna include this here. Intensity of amps, okay? Now, who can give me a fault condition, either phase to phase, two primary phases touching each other, coming in contact, or a phase falls to the ground or touches a grounded object? All right, who can give, give me a definition of a fault? Tree branch falling on the line. All right, but what is it as far as compared to overload? Well, sir, I'm making it run out of, out of the ordinary. All right, short circuit, I heard that time. All right, it definitely is not ordinary. Okay, and who's the first one? Tree limb? Tree limb, yeah. All right, tree limb. All right, something's wrong with our circuit out of the ordinary. Let's talk intensity a little bit, okay? In overload, I'm just going over the rating. To this point, to this point, I've gone over the rating, but not by much. How about in a fault condition? What's my intensity like? Is it extremely high? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's going, yeah, it's going, I'm going. Instead of going over the amp value that I have for the breaker or the circuit, whatever I'm using by here by a little bit, I've only gone up at 100 amps here. All right, in a short circuit, phase to phase or phase to phase to ground situation, we're gonna talk, be talking about in the tens of thousands of amps. All right, that's the difference between overload and fault. Overload, I've just gone over the rating of whatever my piece of equipment is, all right? Not by much, only by 100 amps. Faults are very high in intensity, tens of thousands of amps at one moment, okay? So know those two definitions right here, overload and faults, face-to-face, face-to-ground. 
and we are recording here so you can have this for use later on. Professor V, anything you'd like to add on those two definitions? No, I think that's an excellent explanation. Okay. Do understand when you get information out there from the field or from your dispatcher, anybody tells you, yeah, we've got a transformer and overload. Well, it's just going over the radio a little bit. Or the breaker opened due to overload. It's just gone up over its rating. And they will tell you that in their description. A dispatcher or a supervisor said, yeah, we've got a fault on the line. Well, now we know to look for a different situation right here. We're not looking to upsize our conductor or look for a burned out transformer. Now we've got something that's extreme. We've got either wire touching each other, phase to phase, or we've got wire on the ground, okay? Something is making contact here, very high intensity amperages. All right, so let me go clear the screen. File, new, don't say. So how does this all relate to, and you know, I'm finding it's getting a little bit technical here and I don't expect you guys to be substation designers or, you know, maintenance people, unless you want to be. I've had graduates go that direction. Is here to know out of the field when you hear certain things and uh, get certain bits of information, plus you go to work for utility, you have to know their breaker scheme on their system. All right, and you can learn that right away. In the video, he said one word here that we were going to find later, correct? Uh -huh. All right, who can give me a good definition of instantaneous? What do you think? Almost immediately. Almost right. immediately, yeah. In an instant. Milliseconds of a distance. Right, right. In an instant. Now, breaker technology today has gotten very good, and their equipment's gotten, gotten very good. They're using uh, fiber optics, and the, it's just improving much, much faster and greater. Instantaneous in an electrical system, I'm going to draw a sine wave here. That's one, two, three. Need to add two more. Four, I'm gonna get tight here. All right, we'll say three, two, five. Each one of these is called a what? One full what? Cycle. Cycle. All right, cycle. Five cycles. C-L-E-S, all right. An instantaneous operation on a circuit breaker with the new technology today is supposed to operate, excuse me, open the breaker in three to five cycles. That's extremely fast. And that's what we want when we have an instantaneous operation. By the flag that you saw in the videos right there, that breaker, when you saw the uh, flag turn from C red to O green, that's happening in three to five cycles. Well, let's do, the, let's do a little bit of math here because we're all mathematicians now. How many cycles are in a second? 60. 60 okay. cycles in a second. Excuse me, I can't draw. Control, Z, Z, Z. 60 cycles are in one second. So who can do the math for me here? How fast? is the breaker opening if it's between three to five cycles? Let's use the three first. Let's Almost see. like one fifth of a second. One fifth of a second? I'd say one fourth. 60 cycles happen in one second, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, what's three divided by 60? 20. One 20th of a second. Guys, that's extremely quick. All right, fifth, we go to the five. One 14th of a second. Okay, that's how fast the breaker opens. So that's what they mean by instantaneous operation. All 
right? And there's a purpose for it here, and we'll discuss that in just a moment. So I'm going to go the other. There's two types of operations you can have in a break in a circuit breaker. These are programmed depending on your system. So uh, we've got the instantaneous, the other type of operation that you can program into a breaker is what they call time operation. Now, what do you think they mean by time? It has a certain amount of time before it triggers. Right, right, right. You program this in the breaker, right? I want to close for one second. Now it depends on your system or two seconds. Now remember when this is happening right here and you're on a timed operation of close or open, you can time them both directions. If it's time close, a second on an electrical system with a with a phase to phase or phase to ground fault, you're getting a lot of burning that's going on, okay? Same thing with two seconds. You can let it sit there for two seconds and boil fire that's a lot of time, but they are programmed. I mean, you can go half a second, whatever you want to do as far as your system is concerned. But while that process is happening, fault is, amperage is flowing. And this is dependent on your system. Okay, so two types of operation, instantaneous, whatever happens in an instant, three to five cycles. Time, I can program in here. I want the breaker to sit around and do things for a certain amount of time. All right. Uh, yeah. Now we've heard before, yeah, you've seen it in some of the definitions we've had for the presentation, a substation breaker does anybody have to be there for it to work correctly? No. No, it's pre-programmed. So it's able to go through its different operations, either instantaneous in time, because it's programmed into the breaker itself. No guy is standing there opening a handle, closing a handle, opening a handle and closing the handle. So that, that's not an operation. The typical one we had for Santi Cooper was, and it was programmed in this way, one instantaneous, two time. After that, lockout. We'll discuss lockout here in just a minute. So a normal everyday operation, if a fault incurred on the line, I'd have one instantaneous open and then reclose right back. How fast does that happen? Three to five seconds. Okay, then I'd have two time. If the fault remained, then I would go into the time state. All right, wait one second. Then close. Okay, if the fault still remained, remember our relays are still measuring high amperage, it would open, then wait one more second, then close. If the fault still yeah. remained after all these steps, so that's one eye, one time, one time, I've satisfied my one eye and two time it would go to what they call lockout. Can anybody give me a definition of what lockout means? means it opens up the circuit and locks it so it won't reclose. Excellent, excellent definition right there. Opens, no close. Okay, that's lockout. It's gonna take some kind of human intervention. A crew is gonna get called out they're going to have to patrol the line, fix whatever the problem was. And then uh, the dispatchers are going to take it out of lockout and try to reclose it again. Okay. I'm going to put down here human intervention to close. Uh, Professor V, were you familiar with uh, your breaker scheme as far yeah. as Duke? Yeah, we um, actually had the instantaneous and three time. There you go. Operations for lockout. So what's the purpose? Why don't I just go ahead and have one eye and be done with it? Anybody? An animal could have jumped on the line or yeah, something like that. Great answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lightning strike might have occurred. Tree limb might have fell on the line. An animal might have got on the line. 
it, all of these cases right here, the I and the timed operations right here, give whatever the fault is time to clear itself or move away from the line, okay? If that happens, I don't need to call out any crews. I don't need to do anything. Uh, some companies do monitor the, the amount of times this happened and have to patrol anyway, but the power is still on. So if you've ever been at your house during a storm and the lights blink off real quick, on off, and then they're on for a couple of seconds, maybe a second, then they go off. Then they're off for another second or two, then they come back on. That is a breaker going through its operations. You've ever experienced that, okay? Until eventually it gets to lock out and then your power's off for a long <clears throat> time until they fix whatever the problem was, okay? All right, what time are we holding, Professor V? Uh, 1049. 10.49, I need to get into that uh, load trainer real quick. All right, so as far as you're concerned, know what your system is. I, I gave one example here. Know how your system operates, because I can guarantee you the dispatcher is going to call you through the course, maybe on a treble call, whatever. Scott, we just had an instantaneous operation on Singleton Ridge A. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate the information. Do I need to do anything? No. No. Okay. He calls back, hey, we had our, our first timed operation. I'm going to start heading that direction. To wherever this breaker is located okay uh second operation he calls it back uh the power is on it's gone back to normal i don't need to go any further i'll go somewhere else all right it goes and does through to two timed operation the dispatcher's monitoring and he's going to say scott singleton ray singleton ridge a here it's in lockout well i definitely i got to call my get myself over there and i got to respond crews over there to get it repaired so it's a good indicator to know what your system is like, learn what your system does. All right, last but not least for today, and know what lockout is. Scott Singleton Ridge A is in lockout. All right, if I do- Human interaction. Right, gonna take human, all right. And this falls back to also, I send myself, I go myself, or I send my crews out there and a breaker's in lockout, does that mean I can go on that circuit and not have to wear my rubber gloves or put any rubber goods on? No, you need them on. Why? No, you need them on. Just because they're, it's in lockout doesn't mean there's power inside of that breaker box. Correct. What are we not satisfying here as far as the circuit itself? Satisfying New open box. point. Fantastic. All right. We do not have a visual open point. So I still need to treat this circuit just like it was still energized. Now, back in the day, when everything, yeah, Professor <laughs> Lee could attest to this. Back in the day when uh, everything started becoming automated, we really didn't feel comfortable with the dispatcher saying it's in lockout until we went to the station and opened a switch. Yeah. Correct, Professor V? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we were kind of sketchy on mm -hmm. that. Do you remember, if he calls you, hey, uh, Caribou, I need you to go to this location. We got some lines down. Treat it like it's energized, but he cannot, the dispatcher cannot close the breaker back until you give him permission. You are now assigned to the lockout. He can't do anything with it without your permission. So the comfort level felt a lot better as far as working up behind a lockout breaker. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last but not least. We're gonna give you a scenario here. I'm gonna use the same scheme that I had before on my breaker. Okay, it's one I, two T. What does that mean? One time, two time. One, one instantaneous, two time. two time. Okay, here I am. Here's the pole, transformer working on it. There's my little switch and cross arm right here. And here I am up in a bucket truck. I know I'm an awful drawer here, okay? And I'm working up here, doing some work on the primary. 
as far, and we're on the feeder line, as far as I'm concerned, me working in the vicinity and on those lines right here, what do I want the breaker to do? Open. And say I become, say there's a short circuit here. It's not, me not even involved, or I am involved. I had accidentally touched my head to the primary and I've got uh, my, just my leather glove and I touch the ground. What do I want the breaker to do? The trip. And? Log out. Who said that? Reg. Reggie. All right, so you definitely don't want it to open and close instantaneously and then there, and do it two more times, do you? Mm -mm. No, you don't want that at all. You want what they call an instantaneous open. All right. Professor V's got a different definition and terminology for this than I do, and he'll include his also. H W L P, hot line work permit. You'll call your dispatchers and some companies you have to do this on your own. We'll tell you how to do it later. But whenever you're working in the proximity of an overhead feeder line or an overhead tap line, you must obtain a hot line work permit. All right. What this does is they're gonna send a signal to the breaker and disable timed. And they're gonna disable instantaneous close. This all happens through automation. So I come in contact with the line, what will the breaker do? Walk out. One eye open, correct, and go straight to lockout. It's gonna open in three to five cycles and then lock out, okay? You can see the safety feature that's going on here as far as you working in proximity with these primary conductors. We definitely don't want it to eye open and then close, no way. And we definitely don't want that to happen two more times. We're gonna be sitting up there cooking. Professor V, what do you call what we call the hotline work permit? We call it the hotline tag. Hotline tag, H L T, hot line tag, okay? All right, so the outcome of today was, of course, knowing how a breaker works, know what your scheme is on your system, you know, instantaneous or timed. And whenever you work in proximity of overhead primary conductors, underground's a little bit different. We'll discuss that when we get an underground. Okay, what do you have to have while you work? Right. A hotline work permit or a hotline tag. Now, who can obtain those things? Who's in charge of the site? Who, who's allowed to get a hotline work permit and a hotline tag? Who's in charge of the site? Anybody else? For safety reasons, Anybody, your first day on the job, if the supervisor feels confident with you working. knowing what the responsibility, what the responsibilities are here, you can get a hotline work permit on the circuit that you're working on. And we'll discuss later how you're gonna relay that information to a dispatcher, but for safety reasons, you can get one. Do understand it's gonna involve a little bit of responsibility that's going on here. All right, you call in with your radio. I'd like to get a hotline work permit on Singleton Ridge A. You are now responsible, not only for the location that you're working at, but for the entire circuit. So if they call you back, hey, Scott, we just had an instantaneous open on your breaker. It's locked out, okay? Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott, we can't get a hold of Scott. Oh, yeah. Can they close the breaker? Without getting a hold of the person? No. Nope. So no, it's gonna be you. you gotta More be in action. close, you gotta be in close communications here. 
So you're gonna be taking on that responsibility. Two is, and I'll just extend my line here a little bit. Come to the next pole down. I'm working here at this location, and this is for the entirety of the circuit. 20 spans away, a bird flies into the line. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Line drops. No, we'll just Four. say a bird flew into it, line doesn't come to the ground or anything, but what's going to happen with the breaker? It opens. It's going to open just like you want it to. Remember, you've got a hotline work permit. It's going to eye target. It's going to open. It's not going to reclose. It's going to go to lockout. I mean, guys, this can happen miles away. You don't even see it. All right? Dispatcher's going to, he doesn't know that. Dispatcher's going to call you. He's going to say, hey, Scott, we just had an eye target. That breaker's open on lockout. All you have to do is get your men in, if nothing happened at the location, get your men and the equipment in the clear and tell them to close the breaker back. So those are the responsibilities that are involved in that. Okay? All right. Can you get a hotline work permit if you see a potential fault that's going to happen? Yes. Sure. Sure. If it's not really any danger to the public, but if you want to get a hotline work permit, you see something that's getting may get, you know, in trouble with, the wind's blowing, slapping primary phases together, go ahead and get a hotline work permit. The next time it happens, it's going to lock the breaker out. That's okay. You're preventing damage. All right. Anything else? Anything you'd like to add, Professor V? No, sir. That was good. All right. Great deal. Okay. So tomorrow, because we lost the classroom last Thursday by my decision, what we are going to do tomorrow is we are going to, let me know if we can get my share screen. You got a share on that? Yes, sir. All right. We're going to bring out the load trainers, and this is the uh, last part that will go into the cumulative grade for your exam right here. We're going to bring the load trainers out to the field. Make that a little bit bigger. We'll instruct you on how to uh, work with them and, and what you need to do as far as wiring is concerned. And you guys are going to go ahead. Uh, why did that change? Okay, there's the picture. You guys are going to wire the three banks. We've got closed delta, open delta, and Y on these, and we're going to give you a grade for them. Now, we'll give you the training, obviously, of how to do it. They're really, really simple. Professor V, anything you want to... I know you've been playing with one. Oh, yes. It's, guys, it's just like where you wired up the, um, the transformer banks out on the yard out there, but it's just a little bit easier and you can check yourselves with it. Right, right. You're also going to be able to get actual voltage readings out of these windows. Yep. When you hit the test button, it will actually tell you if you've got it wired in correctly and where your fault occurs. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is fix it. And like I said before, if you wire it up for a closed delta 240 bank and something's wrong, am I going to grade you on that? Am I going to allow you to fix it? Fix. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh. Fix whatever the problem is. All right. And it, as soon as you get to one that's incorrect, then just move on to the next bank right there. All right. Pretty cool, slick piece of equipment. All digital. It is pretty nice to use. Right. And we have two of those. So some will be climbing and some will be just going through the uh, testing process of the three load trainers. Any questions there? All right, I got a question, Professor V. Yep. By this picture, I've got four bushings on this transformer. How does that work? Which of oh, the um, ground bushing at the bottom, the yes. green ground, tank ground? No, the uh, secondary bushings. I've got one, two, three, and four. And I'll bring up this transformer, maybe, to help in your explanation. Yeah, guys, that's just like where we had the three bushing transformers, A, B, C, and D. Those are just individual. That's A, A bushing, B bushing, C bushing, and D bushing. 
and then you just tie the two middle bushes together to, together to give you a uh, BC um, ground in the middle. So your explanation here, because I'm mousing over it, A, A, B, correct, C, B. and D on this far side right here. Correct. The, re the reason why we got the load trainers in this fashion is uh, this gives you the opportunity to use a four bushing transformer or three. Right. But Professor V just explained, if you want to go to a three bushing transformer, you just tie or connect a piece of copper between these two. So now I've got A, B, C, D on this transformer. Pretty, right. tip, pretty typical on, what would you say, 167 KVAs and above? Correct, yes. Yeah, pretty typical on that. So don't let this stump you out there. And once again, we'll help you through this. Uh, 333, uh, Professor V, what's the largest transformer you had in your system? A pole mount. Um, like that, I think we went up to a... Uh, 500. Wow, geez. Yeah. All right. Uh, the largest single phase transformer we had on our system was a 333 kVA. Guys, that, that, that thing's huge. You're going to be looking at, and this is a 19.9 to a 34.5 kV, voltage is 120 to 40. You're going to be looking right around between five and six tons. Yeah, it's heavy. Yeah, it is a huge, huge transformer. You think we could hang a six ton transformer on a 40 foot pole? No. I'm waiting for them. Oh. <laughs> Not that well. Yeah. Now, yeah, what you're going to do here, here, guys, and what we did is you're going to have to have a beefy, beefy pole. Is that if, you, if your line level needed to stay at 40 feet, you'd either take a, a anywhere between a 50 and a 60 foot pole and just cut the top out of it. Yeah. All right then make it you know 40 feet in height and then you'd have a good good diameter pole to mount this transformer on but these things these things are pretty dominant in uh ocean lakes mm. where you don't have anything to go by. you have to do secondary behind all those trailers and you can't put primary down through there so one of these will be at the street then you've got just tons of secondary coming off of this going down back behind the trailers okay so we'll open it up. Any questions as far as today is concerned? No quiz today, right, Professor V? Right on. Okay, no quiz today. Uh, I would study up on my drawings and you've got the uh, actuals, you know, on the website on, in D2L. Study up on those a little bit, be prepared for tomorrow. We will be at the field at 9 a.m. tomorrow and be at the field all day. Yeah. Anything else we need to bring up, Professor V, that you can think of? No, sir. Okay. Any questions by you guys before we uh, close it? And if you've got a private question or anything you want to hang around, by all means do so. Any questions while the full group is here? Mm -mm. All right, gentlemen, with that, have a great day. Hey, have we heard anything from Mark Jones?